be okay. Uh, before our devotion, I just want to make sure that everybody is aware uh, Friday night, uh, we have our first revival service of our 21 days of glory. So make sure that you're here Friday and invite everybody you can to come and be with us. We're expecting a great time. We're actually expecting greater glory. Um, and so just uh, come and bring somebody uh, with you. And I wanted to mention one other thing. Uh, we are in our 90th year. Uh, this year in August, we'll celebrate our 90th anniversary. And we have a 90th anniversary fund that we've set up. And I checked today, and we have 10% of our goal already in. Our goal is $90,000, and we already have 9000 of that in. Uh, and if you haven't decided how you're going to give, uh, give $9 every time you come. Give $90 every time you come. Give $900 every time you come. Give $9,000 every time you come. Give $90,000 every time you come. Or, or give $900,000 every time you can. Uh, but give, and I know the Lord will bless you. I know He will. Uh, he promised in His Word uh, that He would. So uh, find a plan that works for you and be a part of this uh, 90th anniversary uh, offering. God is going to use it to do some things that we need to have done here at the church. So be a part of that. For our devotion, I, I, there was a verse that stuck out in my mind uh, from our Sunday school lesson uh, Sunday morning. And I'm going to read that verse, but before I read that verse, I'm going to read some verses before it. And it's from Titus, the third chapter. And, and we're encouraged to speak evil of no man. Uh, it's a good thing to, for us to be encouraged. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. We, uh, meek doesn't mean you're weak. Meek means you're strong. Uh, you're stronger, uh, strong enough to do what the Bible encourages us to do, to pray for those that despitefully use us and abuse us uh, and show the mercy of, of Christ. Showing mercy unto all men, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another all of that just as my mom would say sounds ugly doesn't it it just sounds ugly but you know there was a time when we were all in that state of being ugly uh, of being lost of being without god needing a savior but it says but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. Thank goodness for the kindness and the love of God our Savior that it appeared. It said, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. And a lot of times people will say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to witness. And all of those things are good. And I believe that we will do them. But it's not those things that change us. It's nothing but the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the mercy of God. But according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration means that I am not who I was. I am born again through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I am made New, I am born again. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. 
And when God makes us new, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost comes and lives in our heart. And He's our teacher and He's our God. Uh, and He will help us to make sure that we stay new. Uh, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. How many of you are happy that you can testify that you are an heir of eternal life, the hope of eternal life, that you can testify, I am a child of the Most High God. I have been made new. I'm not who I was, but I am a child of the Most High God. I told somebody earlier this week, there's grace is such a wonderful, wonderful gift from God. And I told somebody, I said, we don't really know how precious these words are until we really need them. And it's the words found in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, the ninth verse, where he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. You know, somebody ought to write a song about it. Maybe they could title it, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Are you thankful for that amazing grace? Amazing grace. We're going to worship Jesus Christ. We're going to open in prayer. Uh, we need to pray for Doris Durham. She's having surgery. Uh, in the morning. We need to pray for Johnny and Paula Waddell. They're, they're sick. We need to continue to pray for Sister Peggy Chesney. She needs a touch from God. Uh, we need to pray for Mary Anderson. We need to pray for Ann Brown. We need to pray for Nancy O'Shields. We need to pray, continue to pray for Nadell and her family, that the Lord will bring them peace and comfort. We need to continue to pray for uh, the Owens family, the Lord will bring them peace and comfort. We need to pray for Freddie Durham. We need to pray for Carolyn Owens. We need to pray for Jim Polson. We need to pray for Bright Gaston. We need to pray for Julie and all her family and even her boyfriend. He's needing a touch from the Lord. And Julie asks me every week if we'll pray. I believe Julie believes in the power of prayer. And I'm with you, Julie. I know that my God is not just able, but He's well able. And not just to do what I could ask, but He's well able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I could ever think or imagine. It's hard for us to believe that God is that big, but I can assure you He is. And I can promise you that His grace is sufficient for whatever we may encounter or whatever we need. God, we thank You for Your love and Your mercy, and we thank You for Your grace. Your grace is amazing, amazing. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift. It's the gift. Jesus Christ is the way he is the truth and he is the giver of new life a better life the best life eternal life i pray god that you would bless everything that happens in your house tonight i pray that you would help us lord to worship you in spirit and in truth all those that are sick at home all those that are in the hospital all those that are facing some sort of difficulty, I pray, God, that you would be their miracle worker and their healer, their pain taker. I pray, God, that you bless us and help us have your will in your way. And Jesus Christ, be glorified in this place. In your name we ask. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship tonight.
mighty, you are amazing, and you are wonderful, and there is no God like you. You are great. And we're here tonight on this campus, gathered together to worship and to bless and to magnify your great name. And I pray above all else, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done, O oh God, on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. And I just pray that you move all over this campus and do great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good to see you. You may be seated. I appreciate you being here on this beautiful Wednesday evening. What a beautiful day it has been. In just a moment, our ushers will come around and if you have a tither and offering, you can give it now. And so I'm so grateful and thankful for how you guys give. Because you give, we can do the work of the ministry. But Friday night, we start our 21 days of glory. Invite everyone that you can. Invite people that may attend other churches, because I don't really know many churches having church on Friday night, so we would love to have anyone. Um, the doors are open at 5.30 for people who want to come pray before the service, and service will start at 6.30. And we're just believing for God to do exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ask, think, or even imagine. I wasn't able to be at prayer this Monday, but I was so encouraged to hear such a good number of people. And really, Friday's our official start to this 21 Days of Glory, and I would love in our Monday nights at this time to get up to 100 people in prayer, so... Come and pray, and as we pray, we know God answers prayers. And continue to pray that we would draw closer to God than we've ever been before. Because in this life, we can reach all kinds of goals and do all kinds of things, but if we don't draw closer to God, we've missed the mark. Continue to pray that we would see souls saved and lives changed. We had a couple people in our service Sunday turn their heart over to the Lord. After service, we had a little, uh, some, a family had to get together and somebody give their heart to the Lord. So people are turning their heart and life to God. Let's also pray that we would truly, truly see revival and awakening. I know the State of the Union was last night, but no matter what side of the aisle holds the presidency, our hope doesn't come from Washington. Our hope is in God. And as the church, we are the hope of the world. And the church needs to be revived, afresh and anew. So, so good to see Ms. Nadell and Judy here. You continue to pray for them, but we have a sweet car for them. It says, we're so blessed. To be a part of the Woodrow Church of God, your kindness and expressions of love were what we needed in our time of loss. Surely God has placed you in this time and place to be his ambassadors to a world full of chaos. Your love shown to us in Christ was such a blessing. Please know how much we appreciate you and we're uplifted by you. God bless you. We love you, Nadell Rhodes and family. So continue to pray the Roach family, that God would comfort them and strengthen them as they faced loss last week. But we know God is the great comforter, and we're thankful for his faithfulness in the time of need. If you got your Bible today, if you turn to Habakkuk chapter 2, I'm going to preach something real practical and simple tonight called planning for the future. Now, people plan um, finances, and they do financial planning. People plan for retirement. People... Some people even plan their funeral. We plan to go on vacation. Sometimes we plan to take a day off, and we plan all kinds of things. But we must strategically plan our lives around the will and around the purposes of God. The Bible says, how many building a tower doesn't first count the cost and basically make a plan? Now, that's not in Habakkuk. That's what the Word of God says. I mean, if you're going to build a tower, you need to count the cost. You need to put together a plan so you can complete the plan, so you can complete the tower. I talked about Sunday briefly in both of my messages, how one day there's a believer's judgment called the Bema Seat, the judgment seat of Christ, after the thousand-year millennial reign. And the good news of that judgment, we're all going to heaven, but we're going to stand before God, and the works that we've done in our life are going to be judged. And so they're going to be tried by fire. And it should be our goal to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. The Bible says, do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust can destroy them, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. And so a part of our planning and planning our life around the purposes of God, as I told you Sunday, I want to lay up treasures in heaven and I want to have something to lay at the feet of Jesus. And so we must plan our future around the purposes of God. 
So here in the back of chapter 2, it says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me, and I will answer when I am corrected. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablet that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. It will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it surely will come. It will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, so thankful for your holy word that is sharp and powerful and more powerful than any two-edged sword. I ask you, Holy Spirit, as I teach and preach your word tonight, to give me every word to say and every parable to use, and I pray that your word will come forth in power. And I pray you give your children ears to hear your word, that we will be encouraged by the preached word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. They say those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And right now we're at the beginning of February. And if you made some New Year's resolutions, whether they be spiritual goals or economic goals or physical goals, they probably, uh, those resolutions have probably already went out the window. Because they say most people's resolutions last two or three weeks. And so... Since we're starting February, I just want to remind you that having a plan is important. And it's wisdom to plan our life around the will of God, around the truth of God, around the purposes of God. Because if we're not careful, instead of us walking out the purposes of God and intentionally growing in the Lord, we'll get busy living life and everything else will dictate our life, but the will and the ways and the purposes and plans of God. Because we can get busy living life and we can do all kinds of things, but we can miss out on doing the most important things. We must plan the things that are most important in our life. We must prioritize them, and we must put them first. And even when you think about the tithe, the tithe is just not 10%. It's not the third 10%. It's not the last 10%. The tithe is the first 10%. That you make a plan that the first 10% of everything I have, I plan, and I give it to God, and I put God first because it's the Word of God. And so I pay my tithes before I pay Duke Power, before I pay rent, before I pay mortgage, before I pay for car, or whatever I pay for. I give to God what's His, and I plan my life around that because that's the Word of God. That I plan my life around being faithful to the house of God because coming to church is the will of God, and it makes you spiritually strong. I plan my time around spending time with God because spending time every day with God it's very, very important. But another reason it's important to have a plan and to know where God's taking you and to write down some goals and to write down some visions, many of those things become your prayer life. I mean, we pray to fellowship with God. We pray to talk to God. We pray to worship God. We pray to hear from God. And we pray for our own needs. We pray for the needs of others. But we should also be praying about what we are expecting God to do in our life. And we are people of faith. We should be living with a faith and an expectation, and we should be expecting God to do some big things in our life. And as we spend time with God and we pray to God, He will build our faith. And He will encourage us and He will remind us that He wants to move in our life, that He wants to work in our life, and He wants to do great things. In a moment, I'm going to get to my text here in the back where it talks about writing the vision. You may say, Pastor, I did that when I was younger, but I've kind of reached the age where if I look too far out, I'm afraid I may be in glory. I mean, I don't know. But I want you to know if God has you here today and this year and next year, the truth is God has a purpose and we're always going to do better if we make a plan and we make a goal and we pray over that plan and we pray for God to do something. It stretches us. It gives us something to look forward to. It gives us something to pray about. It gives us purpose. Because Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Now, corporately as a church, we must have a vision, but the truth is, if you're going to stay on task, God has you here, and He has a purpose, and there's something He has for you to do, and you've got to plan that vision, and you've got to pray to God and sense what God is saying, and write the vision, write the plans. Other versions say where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint, meaning there's really no boundaries because there's really no plan, and so I just do whatever, but the truth is, is we have a vision and have a plan, 
it gives our life a trajectory. It gives our life a path forward in the Lord. Really, people who don't have a vision, have a plan, really don't know what to do and oftentimes go, toward the, go in the motions and don't really work toward anything. They just kind of go through the motions. A vision determines our goals and then we begin to create a plan to reach them and we begin to pray about them and we begin to see God move and work in great ways. And this is very important because sometimes we just get what we ask for and what we believe for and what we trust God for because the Bible says we have not because we ask not. Now we know there's other times in our life we don't believe for it and we didn't earn it and we didn't do anything for it and God still shows up in his grace and mercy and does all kinds of things because he always blesses us more than what we deserve. And there's all kinds of times he does things that we didn't even ask for and don't even deserve. But there's parts of our life that we're just going to get what we ask for and we're just going to get what we believe for as we cry out to God in prayer and as we trust the Lord. But our text tells us clearly to write the vision and to make it plain. That means that we should have goals and we should have a plan and we should make that plan clear. This is what I'm expecting God to do in my life. I'm a child of God. I'm an overcomer and God has a future for me. I'm just not trying to survive to Friday or Sunday or Tuesday. I'm believing that this year God's going to do some things in my life and in my family and this is what I'm believing him for and I'm not going to stop moving toward it and praying for it until I see it come to pass. Because our vision begins to be what we expect from God. And as people of faith, we should expect a lot from God because we have a great big God and we have a great big faith. And so we should expect a lot. And I just want to ask you, what are you expecting God to do in your life? What are you praying about? What are you looking for God to do right now? Because if you're not expecting God to really do anything specifically, and you're really not praying about anything particularly, I want to encourage you to write the vision and write the plan and begin to pray over it and begin to ask God to do some of those things in your life. Again, you may say, I live day to day. But the Bible is clear. It doesn't say just have some ideas. It says... Write the vision, make it clear, make it thorough, and just lay out before the Lord what you are expecting God to do in your life. And you may say, Pastor, I believe Jesus is coming back this week. Well, I'm going to tell you what, the signs of the times are around us, and He may come back this week. But it is wisdom to live like He's going to come back tonight, but to plan and prepare like He may tarry another hundred years. Because one of the greatest mysteries is the timing of God. And so the truth is, he may come back tonight. But if he tarries another hundred years, we're going to stand before God. And what we're mainly going to be judged on is were we good stewards of our time? Were we good stewards of our life? And one way to be a good steward is to make a plan. Because those who fail to plan oftentimes get distracted and often end up off task. And so we want to intentionally plan so we can place guardrails around our time and guardrails around our lives so we don't get caught up in doing a lot of things, but we never do the main thing. And I believe with all of my heart, the number one main thing we can do is draw near to God and get to know Him like never before. To live in close proximity to Him. So we know we need to have a plan and we need to have a vision. And how do we know what that vision needs to be? Oftentimes people say, well, I just don't know what to plan. I just don't know what to do. We find that in prayer. Verse 1 says, I will stand my watch. And what this means is I'll meet regularly with the Lord in a secret place and stand there in prayer. And then as we spend time with God and pray, it goes on to say, I will watch and see what He will say to me. And when you begin to spend time with God, He'll begin to give your life direction, and He'll begin to help you know what to do. And He's going to do more than help you know how to live right, 
He's going to do more than help you know how to be empowered by the Spirit. He's going to practically begin to let you know what you need to do in every single area of your life so every area of your life can honor God as you move forward with the Lord. So our vision and plan comes from spending time with the Lord. And then as we know what we need to do, we're called to be obedient to it. And a part of our general vision as Christians is to know the Word and to live by the principles and precepts of the Word of God all the days of our life and be faithful to the Word. That's general, but specifically, there's a way that you fit in God's plan and God will reveal that to you as you spend time with Him and as He reveals it to you, you need to write the plan and write the vision and begin to pray over it because if you'll begin to do that, you will be more productive in your walk with the Lord. And I don't know about you, I'm planning on laying up for myself treasures in heaven and I don't have time to waste time. I don't have time to beat the wind. I want a crown to lay at the feet of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want a crown to lay at the feet of God. So as we walk with God and serve God, many times our vision will be to be a part of another vision. So if you attend this church, part of your vision could be and really should be that this year I want to see the greater glory of God in my church and in my family, that we're believing that God is pouring out His Spirit. God is pouring out His power. So it becomes a part of our prayer life. Lord, show us, show us, show us your glory, show us your power, show us your goodness, show us your mercy, show us your strength. Show up, O oh Lord. And show out in our life. John Bevere teaches that when we're faithful to God and we're a good steward, we'll see the increase of God over our faithfulness. You know, if you look at the parable of the talents, the two who were faithful, they got more, they got increase. And what happens is when we're faithful, God begins to bless us with increase. The Bible says, He who is faithful over a few things that God would make him ruler over many. God brings promotion as we're faithful and we serve him and we do the best we can to love him and do his will. Also says in verse 2 that we must write the vision and make it plain. It must be clear that you know sometimes being simple is a gift. You know, I know nobody really needs the newspaper very much anymore, not like they used to. But, you know, I think they're saying newspaper will be written maybe on a 7th or 8th grade English level because it's written for the common person. But, you know, you can have a real grandeurous plan, but if it's so complicated you can't even understand it, people might be impressed when they read it, but if you can't understand it, if you can't break it down in steps, just write something down and make it plain and just say, God, I love you. This is what I'm believing for you to do, O Lord. And it may be as simple as I want my whole family to be saved and I don't want there to be no heathen in my family. But just make it simple and bring it to God and pray it. And pray it. And pray it. And believe it. And then we must hold ourselves accountable to actually taking steps toward the vision and the plan that God has given us. You may say, Pastor, God's called me to be a person of prayer. Well, you can't talk about praying. You've got to pray. Amen. Because you'll never be a person of prayer without praying. And so, what I do in my life, if I ever make a vision of anything, I find something practical that I can do to work toward it. I heard this story several years ago about a group of pastors. They went to a pastor's conference. And all of them had put on, through the stress of the ministry, a good bit of extra weight. Because you know us preachers really like that fried chicken. Oh, and a lot of other stuff too. And so as they were driving back, they were like, you know, we have stressful lives. What we do for the Lord puts a lot of stress on our bodies. And we want to get more healthy. And so about halfway home, they stopped at a gas station. And everybody got like two or three things of ice cream and all this stuff. And all these candy bars. I don't know what they got, but it was just a bunch of junk food, you know. And they all got in the car, 
And one said, do we mean this or do we not mean this? Because with what we come out with, we're talking a good game, but we're not really doing anything to work toward what we just talked about. And there comes a time where if we're going to trust God and see Him do something great, that we have to be willing to do our part and practically take steps toward what we're believing and we're trusting God to do. As they say, a journey of a thousand miles just begins with one step. You may have a great, great big vision and a great big plan, but it's going to start with one step toward it, trusting God. And what I love with God, just one little act of obedience goes a long way. And then another act of obedience goes a long way, and God will put His hand on it. And God will begin to bless it. And God will begin to use it. And those good decisions will begin to compound as God puts His hand on it, and God will begin to bless it. The truth is, you can have all these visions, and you can have a goal that you want to go toward, but if you never take a step toward it, it's called a fairy tale. And so we must hold ourselves accountable to taking steps toward our visions and plans and things that God is laying in our heart. You know, if we have a desire to be a soul winner, that's a great matter of prayer because only the Holy Spirit can convict someone and allow them to be saved. But God and the Spirit does use people. And if we're going to be a soul winner, there comes a time we have to open up our mouth and share the gospel and share the love of God and share the good news. And I can tell you, I believe one of the greatest callings and goals of our life should be to be soul winners. Be used to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Something else I believe that we need more of is a Barnabas anointing. The Barnabas anointing is an anointing of encouragement. Barnabas means the son of encouragement. And we need people full of the Spirit that love God to have just an anointing on their life to encourage people encourage people, to pray for people. And you know, God has a sense of humor. You, you may be a pessimistic person that you can't hardly encourage yourself. And God may place it in your heart that He wants you to be like a Barnabas and encourage people. And as you begin to step out and encourage others and pray for them, you may find it gets a whole lot easier for you to be encouraged. It gets a whole lot easier for you to walk in encouragement toward yourself because there's something about just helping others that seems like God helps us so much. And so, plan and pray and watch God move and work. But this is one of the most important parts of this, and this is why at all times in our life, in all seasons, no matter how young or old we are, we need something to look forward to. We need something to look forward to. We need something to get excited about. Because I never want to get to a place in my life that's mundane and it's not exciting, and I'm just, ex I'm just surviving until the trumpet blows. But until Jesus comes, I want to be motivated about something that revolves around the purposes of God. But it says to write the vision and make it plain that when you read it, you may run with it. That when you begin to read it, you get so excited about what you read and what you feel and what God's doing that it makes you want to get up and run. Now you can get up and you can crawl, you can get up and you can walk and you can trot and you can jog, but when you run, you're going as fast as you can. You're going as fast as you can. And when the Spirit begins to stir things in you and you begin to pray about them and you begin to write them down, it'll create an energy and a momentum that'll make you want to run. It'll give you something to get excited about. It'll give you something to look forward to. It'll give you something to work toward. Even if you're in the age of retirement, these spiritual goals give you a new purpose because in the kingdom of God, there's never a complete retirement. We never can be totally spiritually inactive. There's things that we continue to do that can provide purpose and provide power and provide joy and provide excitement that even in some of the latter years of our life, God wants us to redeem the time because there's things He has for us to do. And these plans that the Lord stirs in our spirit that we begin to write down and work toward creates a purpose and an excitement and gives us something to work toward and to look forward to. When we have a God vision and plan, it lets us know what we need to work toward. 
It lets us let us know what we need to spend our time on. It lets us know what we need to say no to. Because if God's led you in a certain direction, and He's put a certain trajectory on your life, there's some things that's automatically no. I've been pastoring two or three years, and I pastored a small church. And a man called me about being a youth pastor at a church of like a thousand people. I mean, I was only like, you know, 23, 24 years old. I mean, and you know, in the natural, that looked really good, but it didn't take me but about two seconds to say, I'm not interested because I know I'm not called to be a youth pastor. It's not a part of my vision. Pastor Jason does great, but I've just never felt a call to youth, specifically, you know, like every week. When I was 18 years old, I felt more comfortable preaching to adults than I did young people. It's just not my flow. So I know what my vision is. I know what my calling is. So it didn't matter how great it was. No. I didn't even have to pray about it because I just know that's not my flow. That's not what God's called me to. It's not a part of my vision. And so as you begin to determine what God has called you to do and what your plan is, it'll automatically let you know some things you need to do. And it'll automatically let you know some things that you need to say no to. The vision that we have for our life comes in God's timing. God is seasonal. And there could be things that God wants to do in our life that take many, many, many years. Thinking about Moses, we talked about him Sunday a good bit and how Really, it was 80 years old before Moses really entered his purpose. He had 40 years in the palace and 40 years in the wilderness. And then after 80 long years, finally, it was the appointed time for him to really be the leader God called him to be. And the Bible says the vision is yet for an appointed time. So there's an appointed time. Life is seasonal. And when you're working towards something that you know God's put in your heart to do, it's very important to understand the season that you're in in your life. Because the truth is, there's some visions that may take many, many years. There's some things you're praying about God's going to do, but you're not going to see it in your lifetime. There's some people in your family you're going to pray for, they're going to get saved, but you're going to be in glory when they get saved. But one of the reasons they're going to get saved is because your witness and your prayers. And so some of these things that's going to come to pass, we're not even going to see them with our own eyes but it'll be a part of our spiritual legacy because the vision is yet for an appointed time. And you know when we minister to people and we share the gospel and we love on them, God always does more than what we see. And did you know as we're faithful to do the work of the Lord and love on people and share the good news, they could be people that they were young in age and maybe they were on drugs or in a rough lifestyle and you share the love of God with them, and 50 years later or 40 years later, they could be laid on their deathbed somewhere and remember what you told them, and they get saved, and you had a part in that, and you thought you were just sharing something they didn't even get at the time. When we do God's work, more happens than we, we ever realize. And only in heaven will we understand, when we do His work, the impact that we've made. So life is seasonal. The vision is yet for an appointed time. Sometimes, plans we work toward take a long, long time to come to pass. The Word of God says, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, he may run who read it. The vision's yet for a point of time, though it may tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come. It will surely come. Again, a vision could take many years to come to pass. It could be that your vision is so big or the plan you have is so big, it may take the next generation to accomplish it. I know in my life some of the blessings and benefit I have is because my grandparents and my parents have been so faithful to God. And I can see because of that that it's helped me and blessed me and set me up to go further. And I want to do the same thing for my children. The Bible talks about how our children are arrows into the next generation. And so our biological children, our spiritual children, are arrows of the next generation. One day I'm going to be around the throne of God, but I pray I have six arrows full of the power of the Spirit of God doing the work of the Lord while I'm worshiping the Lord. And I have other spiritual sons and daughters in the Lord that I invested in, that while I'm in glory, they're still giving the devil a fit. Amen. That's a part of my vision. Also, when you even look at the Word of God, David was a great man 
a man after God's own heart, and he was a man of worship. I mean, you just read worship, worship, a psalm, worship, prayer, and praise. And he wanted to build a temple to God. But he didn't get to do it. But his son got to do it. So there could be parts of things that we plan, that we want to do and we want to do, but for whatever reason, it's God's will, the next generation does it. But you know what? Without David, although he didn't build the temple, the temple never would have come to pass because he laid the groundwork. And see, there'll be some things in our life that we're never going to see with our own eyes, but we lay the groundwork for the next generation. And that God moves beyond even our time here on this earth through the pathway and legacy that we lay and we build. And you know, Moses spent all that time, really 80 years in the wilderness. He spent 40 years preparing to lead for 40 years through the wilderness, and he never got to lead to the promised land. But he had a spiritual son named Joshua who did. It really didn't seem fair. I mean, Moses spent all this time being faithful, and Joshua takes over and leads him over the Jordan River. But the truth is, God is God, and He has a plan. And all we can do is our part in the plan. The Bible says, some water, some plant, but God gives the increase. I realize there have been times in my life that I've done some plowing and planting. And there's other times I've done some harvesting. That's fun. Remember years ago, I was in my early 20s. I was selling insurance, and I did that for four or five years. And I was on a lady's front porch in Greenwood, and the Spirit of the Lord has said, talk to her about her soul. Talk to her about the Lord. And I said, I know I'm here for business, but the Spirit of the Lord has just arrested me that today is the day of salvation for you, and Jesus died for you, and Jesus wants to save you today. And she just busted out crying. And she said, I want to get saved right now. And I prayed the sinner's prayer, and it was a real powerful experience. And he said, you don't understand. She said, I've been going to a revival all week. And she said, I've been wanting to go down to the altar every time. But she said, I know everybody in that church, and they know everything I've done. And I've been ashamed to walk down to that altar because they know my past. She said, but God sent you to my front porch to tell me about Jesus and just cried. Truth is, there was a whole lot of work went into that. I just got to do the harvesting. But there were plenty of other people that had invested to get it to that point and planted seeds. And it sure is fun when you get to do the harvesting, but sometimes you got to do some plowing. And sometimes you just have to do the hard work, but it's just as important. So whether you're plowing or planting or harvesting, just do it all into the Lord and let Him give the increase. If you'll stand to your feet tonight. Heavenly Father, You are a God of purpose. You are a God of power. And it's wisdom, Lord, to plan and to pray and to expect You to do great things. And Lord God, I pray we wouldn't settle, but I pray we would plan and prepare and pray and expect You to do great things. Lord, I pray in the name of the Lord that we would continue to see greater glory. We're praying for it. We're fasting for it. We're believing for it. And we've been seeing it. And we're going to continue to see it. And God, we praise You for that. We worship You for that. We honor You for that. And Lord, we thank You that You are showing up and you are moving in our hearts, and you're moving in our lives, and you're moving by your Spirit. We say, Spirit of the living God, break out, break out, break out, and do whatever you want to do, because it's not by might, not by power, but by your Spirit, saith the Lord. And Lord, if there's someone here tonight, and they're just going to mundane Christianity, trying to make it day to day, God, I pray you'd stir something in them of fresh and anew, and they begin to plan and write some plans that make them want to run and see purpose and give them something to look forward to and give them something to dream about and give them something to pray about, God, because we just don't want to survive. Do you come or you call, uh, call us home, Lord? We want to go out full of the Spirit, trusting you, praying to you, and seeing you move and work and do what only you could do. So I pray tonight that you would stir us afresh and anew in our spirit, God, toward the will of God and the purposes of God, and hunger for you like never before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Good to see you.